Drowning is defined as suffocation resulting from submersion or immersion in a liquid. This leads to injury primarily through two mechanisms. 1. The effects of fluid entering the airway and lungs. 2. Generalized hypoxia, which can rapidly lead to multi-organ failure. But it doesn't stop there. Drowning often involves precipitating factors like alcohol intoxication, drug use, seizures, or even underlying conditions such as myocardial infarction or hypoglycemia. It's also important to note that coincidental injuries, such as cervical spine trauma from diving accidents, are common and must be considered during initial assessment. Drowning disproportionately affects the young, with toddlers and teenagers being the most frequent victims. Globally, it stands as a leading cause of accidental death among children, highlighting the urgent need for preventative measures. Emphasizing water safety education is crucial, as it can significantly reduce the incidence of these tragic events and save countless lives. The physiological process of drowning involves a complex cascade of events. Initially, laryngospasm occurs, where the vocal cords reflexively close to prevent water from entering the lungs. For decades, textbooks emphasized the difference between freshwater and seawater drowning. However, recent evidence suggests these distinctions may not be as significant as once thought. Here's why. In both cases, laryngospasm, the reflex closure of the vocal cords, often occurs immediately upon submersion. This means little water actually enters the lungs initially. If aspiration does occur, the volume of aspirated fluid is typically small but enough to cause profound pulmonary damage. Regardless of the type of water involved, the outcome depends more on the duration of submersion and the severity of hypoxia than on whether the water was fresh or salty. Patients who survive the initial event and reach medical attention usually present with signs of severe hypoxia. These include unresponsiveness, hypotension, cyanosis, and signs of cerebral hypoxia, such as seizures or altered mental status. In addition, rapid airway obstruction due to laryngospasm can lead to negative pressure pulmonary edema, a condition where fluid leaks into the alveoli because of extreme inspiratory effort against a closed glottis. When managing a drowning victim, remember, time is brain. Every second counts. Here's your step-by-step -step approach. Airway management. First, clear the airway of any debris, such as sand, vomitus, or foam. Use suction if necessary. Secure the airway with intubation if the patient is unresponsive or unable to protect their own airway. Consider cervical spine precautions, especially if there's suspicion of trauma. Oxygenation and ventilation. Administer high-flow oxygen using a non-rebreather mask or CPAP circuit if available. For patients with inadequate breathing, initiate mechanical ventilation immediately. Anesthesia support is ideal here. Be prepared to decompress the stomach with a wide-bore nasogastric tube, as swallowed water and air can lead to gastric distension and further compromise ventilation. Circulation support Establish intravenous access promptly and start fluid resuscitation. Isotonic fluids like normal saline are preferred. Monitor vital signs closely. Oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, pulse, blood pressure, ECG, and core temperature. Send blood samples for CBC, blood chemistry, glucose levels, and arterial blood gases to assess metabolic disturbances. Blood tests, imaging, and investigations. Obtain a 12-lead ECG to rule out cardiac arrhythmias or ischemia. Perform a chest X-ray to evaluate for aspiration pneumonia, pulmonary edema, or other complications. Address complications. Treat hypotension aggressively with fluids and vasopressors if needed. Manage wheezing or bronchospasm with nebulized bronchodilators. Correct severe acidosis with sodium bicarbonate under guidance from blood gas results. Don't forget to address hypothermia, which is common in drowning victims. Passive rewarming techniques and warmed intravenous fluids are key interventions. One critical point to highlight is delayed exacerbations. Even after stabilization, worsening symptoms can occur up to 24 hours post-injury. 
This underscores the importance of admitting all drowning patients to the ICU for close monitoring. Additionally, patients with signs of cerebral hypoxia, such as persistent unresponsiveness, should be ventilated even if their oxygenation appears adequate. Cerebral edema is likely contributing to their condition, and controlled ventilation helps reduce intracranial pressure. Suffocation refers to external obstruction of the mouth and nose, while asphyxiation encompasses broader causes of oxygen deprivation, such as strangulation or toxic gas exposure. The treatment principles overlap significantly with those for drowning, prioritize airway management, oxygenation, and addressing secondary complications. In conclusion, drowning is a complex process involving hypoxia, aspiration, and potential trauma. Immediate priorities are securing the airway, providing oxygen, and stabilizing circulation. All patients require admission, preferably to an ICU, due to the risk of delayed complications. Remember, prevention is better than cure. Educate families about water safety, especially for children.